You're listening to the Gen Y Leaders Podcast, Episode 7. Hey everyone, this is Eric Huey, host of the Gen Y Leaders Podcast, where we interview and learn from millennials who are leaders in their fields. These are individuals who have started their own businesses, have a high-ranking title within companies, or simply pursuing non-traditional means, such as their passion or hobby, to support themselves and their families. You know, there still exists this negative stigma around our generation that we are entitled, lazy, and unreliable. So my goal is to prove that wrong, while also inspiring millennials to become the best versions of themselves and go after their big goals. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Gen Y Leaders Podcast. Appreciate you all listening. It is now August, guys. The year is flying by, and August means that it is hot. And I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a ton of kids with lemonade stands on a lot of corners. And that's always been an interesting concept to me, right? These kids are more interested in selling and lemonade and, and making money on the street corner rather than playing kickball or going to the swimming pool. And I've just come to the realization that some people from an early age have entrepreneurship truly in their blood. And that's a perfect topic for today's guest, who is Drew Taylor, founder of Digital Nomad University. Now, what Digital Nomad University does, uh, if you've ever seen influencers or freelancers or vloggers posting about their work-life balance and working remotely from the beach and taking surfing lunch breaks, that's essentially what Drew and his business, Digital Nomad University, does. He essentially helps someone take something that they're passionate about or an expert in and make a business out of it so they can work remotely and do life on their own terms. In today's episode, we talk exactly about that. We discuss Drew's entrepreneurial journey and spend most of the time on Digital Nomad University. If you're interested in becoming a digital nomad or starting your own online business, be sure to stick around to the end. Drew gives us his Digital Nomad three-step blueprint to get your business moving. Here's my interview with Drew Taylor. Everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gen Y Leaders Podcast. Here with a good friend, an exciting guest that I think you all enjoy and learn from, Drew Taylor. Drew, welcome to the show. Hey, I'm excited to be on, man. Yeah, thanks for being here. So, Drew, pretty easy to start off with. I usually just intro every episode just for the listeners to get a better idea about who you are and what you do by saying exactly that. Who are you? Yeah. What do you do? <clears throat> hey, that's easy, man. Um, you know, <laughs> softball, thing. Yeah. softball approach for the first one. <laughs> <laughs> we can handle that. Um, so yeah, my name is Drew Taylor. Uh, I'm 31 years old. Um, you know, I consider myself a serial entrepreneur. Um, I love love the game of business, and so um, you know, I, and I love creating things. And so I, I've been doing that now for quite a while, but you know, really full time for a little over six years now. So um, I guess when it comes to what do you do, uh, I build businesses, I build companies, and um, I try to help people. That's really what it comes down to. What's your why? You know, what, what keeps you motivated? What's your drive to start all these businesses and uh, ideally sell them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's the goal right there is, yeah. yeah, get to the point where, you know, get out of them at some point. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, my, my why really started when I was 13 years old. And I won't really drag this out too far, but ultimately um, I was raised in a, you know, very um, low income home in uh, good old Wichita, Kansas. Uh, pretty rough part of town, you know. Um, we were kind of minorities in the neighborhood and whatnot, and um, uh, but it was where what my par- where my parents could buy a house. Right. And so um, I have four sisters as well as myself. So there was wow. all seven of us living in a 950 square foot home. Oh my gosh, you were outnumbered. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, being the only boy in the family definitely had its perks. I was the only one who got their own room, right? Nice, you know, there you go. About eight by eight, but hey, it was my own room. <laughs> Still counts. Yeah, and, uh, but, you know, at the same time, it definitely had its downsides as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Being the only boy and, uh, you know, having to put up with all that estrogen every day. Yeah. But, and also was homeschooled, so we were home a lot. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I, you know, the, the one thing, um, you know, we, we did have a great family, um, you know, group in the church, and so a lot of love in the house. Yeah. But the one thing I always saw my parents fight over <clears throat> and struggle with was money. And, uh, Sorry to hear that. Yeah, so it was something, you know, we knew every year for Christmas. It was like, hey, you got to ask for that one thing, you know, don't, don't you know, can't be too expensive. Um, don't expect it, you know, if you get it, then, hey, you know, great year. But ultimately, we just kind of realized, um, you know, well, we didn't really need money, but it definitely caused some stress in the family. Mm-hmm. So seeing my parents go through that, trying to support the family, um, you know, build a family off of, you know, very menial income. Uh, I just knew, you know, I was thinking I was like 13 years old. Uh, I noticed like one day when I have a family, 
I'm, I'm going to take care of this first. I'm going to make sure, not that money is everything, but ultimately due to the stress and, you know, the hardships that I put my parents through, just even in their relationship, I knew that I wanted to take care of that before I ever, um, you know, started building a family um, just because I didn't want that to kind of bog down what could be something so amazing just simply because, you know, funds were tight. Right. Absolutely. That's so, an awesome story. I'm sure your parents are very proud of you, seeing how far you've come. Absolutely, man. You know, I've, I, that my parents have changed and grown so much over the years. You know, I hope that I played a little bit of a role in, in helping them kind of get to that point. But my parents are out there crushing it now. And, yeah. you know, obviously still kind of digging themselves out of, you know, uh, some old debt and whatnot, you know. But, I mean, I think that's the majority of people these days. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah, I think they kind of realize that there was uh, something else out there. And so um, it's pushed them to kind of go out, ask more questions, do more things, and, and honestly just kind of get to a point where they are uh, getting a lot more comfortable these days. So, yeah. Well, thanks for that background. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So you talk about that, that spark when you're 13. What then was the next step to where you, know, you had your first experience or first taste with entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, so since we did grow up in a family similar to that, um, you know, you kind of had to earn your keep. Um, and so we were honestly all kind of playing a part when it came to, um, you know, pay, helping to pay the, some of the bills and things like that. And so early on, you know, it's probably the same as most, you know, most kids. It was uh, landscape, you know, um, jump out there, you know, use the family mower and, you know, mow some lawns, blow out some gutters, literally anything that I could do around the neighborhood because, uh, you know, if you wanted any spending money, you know, that you had to make it yourself. Right. And so it was a good experience. You know, I definitely learned some hard work um, along the way. And, and so, yeah, that was just the easiest way for me to get things going. And then over the years, you know, it just kind of mutated into really anything I get my hands on, um, anything that I could buy and sell and flip mm -hmm. for a profit um, or, you know, to ultimately, you know, buy myself that new Game Boy, whatever it was at that time. So <laughs> whatever the motor underlying motivating factors were. Yep, exactly. That's awesome. From what I understand, you're leading four businesses currently. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do is just to give the listeners an idea of how entrepreneurial you are. I'd like to maybe touch briefly on each one of those and how involved you are currently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I, you know, really kind of got into my, my true entrepreneurial journey, right? I've had different businesses over the years. I've, you know, I don't know, I'd consider myself an entrepreneur, but, you know, even in the network marketing space, you know, I tried my hand out there for a while. Um, you know, just anything that I could do to, to grow myself, grow my income, et cetera. <clears throat> and so there's a few things that have come and gone, but really, it all kind of started uh, full force about seven years ago, and that's when I was still in corporate America. I was working a phone sales job. I hated it every single day, <laughs> and so that's a lot of motivation to get out of it. You know, a lot of people use that as an excuse not to do anything, but for me, that was that was you know adding fuel to the fire. Right. And so, uh, you know, I, I read a book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, um, and that really got my mind thinking around like, okay, business. Uh, automated systems, you know, finding a way to allow your business to work for you as opposed to you doing it 110% yourself. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that concept really stuck with me, you know. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, a, temporarily hustling so I can be, you know, uh, lazy forever, basically, yeah, you know. Yeah, I like that. Have we heard the phrase, you got to, at some point, you have to stop working in the business so you can work on the business. Absolutely. To help it grow and, to your point, yeah, sell it off and um, be that serial entrepreneur. Absolutely, man. So, you know, the different businesses, um, I, I ended, owned a, a social media management company for a while, um, which uh, is no longer. I ended up selling that one off um, when I first left corporate America. That's what I knew. You know, I knew yeah. social media. I knew it was going to be huge. Right. And obviously that was already very apparent, you know, seven years ago. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I built that company up. You know, it was just I wasn't even doing like lead gen for clients, no nothing. It was just like no businesses had any presence online. Right. So all I did was create different value based posts for them and schedule those out each week and, you know, and, and do that for the clients. And so uh, from there, I, I took the profits when I sold that business after about a year uh, to start my uh, my primary company that has actually really uh, led the way for all the other opportunities um, just because you know a lot of companies they are going to take some funds to get things rocking and rolling yeah. and so that was movement logistics uh, which is an online freight brokerage where we move uh, different commodities across the United States Canada and parts of Mexico um, that it came from the fact that I had been in a phone sales job previously 
and it was in the, the freight world. So I kind of learned the back end of that, uh, of that world, knew that I could, if I did it on my own, be more profitable with it, but had to sit out for a little while due to a non-compete. So I'm sure, uh, yeah, most people are really familiar with that. Uh, so you got to obviously play that game uh, very carefully and then, off, you know, follow the rules for the most part. Right. Um, and so, yeah, um, you know, we, we, uh, we move products. Uh, we're, we're just the broker, though. So we don't own any assets, uh, no trucks, um, you know, very minimal employees. We are basically the middleman that connects, you know, the end customer who needs their product moved from uh, California to Chicago. All we do is we basically find a driver uh, based on our massive carrier network that we can pull from find a driver who's going to do it cheaper than their guy will. Okay. So if the customer, if they're going to pay $2,800 to move that load, uh, we'll go through our network till we find someone for $2,000, maybe $2,200, and then uh, we'll remark it up to, or we'll resell that rate at $2,600 and make the spread in between. So that's kind of uh, what a freight broker does, right. you know, okay. in a very small snippet there. Yeah. So you said being in the phone sales job helped you identify that need that this could potentially turn into something? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The, the biggest issue that we had in, in that phone sales job is it was a churn and burn environment. Mm -hmm. Not only with employees, right? It was a revolving door. You know, I was one of the few who made it as long as I did, five years with that company. Yeah. Um, but it was also the same thing with customers. And I just realized a big, huge lack that if you were actually to service these customers the right way, they'll stick with you forever. Right. And, you know, now we've proven that concept. You know, now that we've done millions and millions of dollars of revenue over the last, you know, six years, and we have customers that you know have been shipping with us since the first six months. Awesome. Well, let's keep it moving and let's go to to the next one. Is that Synaptic Media? Yeah, Synaptic Media. Um, so, due to you know obviously learning how to grow businesses, marketing is a huge piece of that. And pretty soon you learn different tricks of the trade when it comes to social media, when it comes to advertising, etc. Uh, and it just made too much sense. We were already doing these things to grow. Uh, you know, I would say we, but you know, I was doing these things to grow my company. But ultimately, I knew I couldn't really start another business. So, um, or that's you know what I told myself at least. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so I met a, a good buddy along the way here about three years ago, uh, who is also very uh, versed in the marketing space. And we decided rather than kind of handling our onesie twosies clients here together or you know separate, might as well bring our heads together and actually build out a full blown agency. And so that's where Synaptic Media came in. Um, synaptic is uh, just kind of a play on words. Uh, you know, your synapses are firing every single time that you're watching something, seeing something, thinking about something. You got these different synapses firing in your brain. And so ultimately, we want to essentially incept people to think our particular way. And so Synaptic Media like was it. born. Yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it's been a fun ride uh, over the last, um, yeah, three years or so. We've had clients, um, but honestly, you know, it's one of those things where trying to push things off to a four-hour work week, you know, we've brought some people on, some virtual assistants overseas so that we don't always have to be, you know, kind of a, the one running the show. Yeah, and uh, ultimately, yeah, we still service clients today, but l thankfully not a whole lot of involvement needed in that business anymore. Great. Yeah. yeah that's, that's the best kind of business to be in where you don't have to be involved. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what do we have left? Digital Nomad University and then Self-Made Threads, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll actually start with Self-Made just because, um, you know, D Digital Nomad University is kind of new in the last two years or so. Yeah. Um, Self-Made Threads was a, uh, we're, we're basically an online apparel company where um, we basically, yeah, we want to inspire uh, and, and also teach people how to um, basically become self-made in whatever they're doing, right? Um, people do have the option to take control of their life and actually do something with it. And most people put themselves in this victim to circumstance mindset of like, well, this is happening to me as opposed to this is happening for me. Right. And um, if you stay in that mindset, there's nothing you can really do for yourself because you're a victim to your own life. And so, um, you know, when it really comes down to it, nobody's really self-made. Everybody, there's different factors, there's different people that play a role in that person's life that make them who they are. Um, not to mention, you're, you're made by a creator. So yeah. ultimately, uh, no one is truly self-made, but the brand itself just really stood for the fact that you do have options, you do have choices as long as you take control of your life and make it what you want. Um, and obviously, sometimes it takes a little bit of pain, sometimes it takes a, a lot of hardship. But ultimately, if you know where you're going, you'll eventually get there. You know, yeah, just sure. stay the course. I love that. Yeah. Get me pumped up just listening to that. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. What about that? How long has that one been going? Uh, Self-made threads is actually the business I, I was still running when I was um, 
still in corporate America. So okay. that business has been running for about eight years. Now. Nice. Yeah. Which the cornerstone. Crazy. Yeah, it really was, man. That's awesome. Got me thinking differently. Got me re reading some extra books. And, um, you know, now that business, uh, you know, kind of going back to Tim Ferriss, that business is on, on complete autopilot. Wow. Um, yeah. I, I don't really post on social media anymore. We have a decent enough present that presence that people find us uh, through SEO or find us through, on, you know, uh, searching us on Google. And uh, we have a drop shipper for all of our apparel is print on demand. Okay. So every time a shirt gets purchased, they pull off a blank shirt from their, you know, stockpile for, of the brand that we, t we choose. They print our logo, our design or whatever they ordered. Um, we, they, they'll print mugs for us. They'll print hoodies, et cetera, socks, you name it. And, um, and then they automatically ship it out. Market is shipped. I never have to touch a product or speak to a customer unless maybe there's a return. So it's, uh, it's all kinds of fun, man. The drop shipping thing just totally fascinates me. I hear about it more and more lately and, um, that being a, an a avenue or a realm that people can explore when they're doing a digital nomad thing. So absolutely uh, make me come back to that cause I want to learn more, but I want to interrupt you before you tell us about digital nomad university. Cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so digital nomad university was really my passion project. Originally that was self-made threads, but then ultimately once it got automated and honestly life kind of hits you when, you know, when one of your businesses is making a lot more than the other, you kind of back burner it and you got to focus where the growth is, you know, uh, growth solves everything for the most part. And so it's growing. <laughs> you got to keep feeding that baby. Right. For sure. And so, uh, um, what's Warren Buffett say the first rule of business is don't lose business or don't lose yeah, money. Never, or something yeah, like exactly. That. Yeah. First rule of this investing, don't lose money. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Dude. <laughs> No, nothing less than 5% is right. his, his memo. So, um, but yeah, with uh, Digital Nomad University, um, it was, like I said, it was a passion project for me. Um, I had definitely learned a few things online uh, as far as, you know, what it took to have a social presence, to build a brand, uh, to create a company that actually, you know, profited by doing something I actually enjoy too. Because um, throughout all this, um, I kind of, you know, just was branded not unknowingly, you know, just putting up some motivational quotes here and there, uh, just some ideas and concepts that might have been new to, to people online. And uh, ultimately, I found myself in this influencer space of, um, you know, people kind of looking to me for advice in business. And so I'm like, oh boy, okay. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, I'm able to help people, but I didn't realize how profitable it would be as well. And so that was just icing on the cake. And I knew that I wouldn't be the only one who just wanted to learn how to do that because I kind of fell into it just because of my passions and my, uh, you know, my interests. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and kind of package that into uh, first, it was just an online community through Facebook, teaching people how to build a lifestyle business around the things they're passionate about. And it's now mutated into a full-blown online course, university. We teach people, um, you know, how to do just that, but at a much deeper level. Uh, Facebook ads, building funnels, uh, creating email lists around the things that they actually want to do. So I would say, you know, whether you're interested in fitness or fly fishing, you can make a profit from it. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I guess every business goes through this point of proof of concept or essentially a, a proof that this business model work and that you can get money from it with digital nomad university what exactly was that what was the point where you're like oh yeah i, I could do this well to be honest like it, it wasn't originally intended to be a business it was just like a way to help out the community um you know other people brand new entrepreneurs who are wanting to do the thing on you know do something online and i knew that i would make money from it just because you know there's certain tools out there, whether that be ClickFunnels or AWeber for their email automation. I knew that if I was obviously the one to refer them, I would get a kickback from the company. And so I knew that the affiliate stuff would kind of take care of that. Um, but then once you realize that there's more of a need than just surface level information to get people started, you really needed to go into depth of here's how to do this, click this, tap that, write this here. Uh, then I decided, okay, well, we have better go ahead and step it up. There's people who are ready for it, and if I don't come out with a product, somebody else will. Right. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thanks for the insight there. So another thing I want to just mention to, to the listeners real quick is that Drew is is the guy for, for being a digital nomad. I actually had trouble scheduling an interview with him because he was coming back from snowboard, snowboarding in Colorado, correct? And then he's yep. just leaving here in like five or ten days to, to go to Cancun. Is Cancun, that right? Cancun, yeah. Very nice. Absolutely. Best of both worlds, close together. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. Uh, nothing I love more than the beach. And, you know, my favorite sport, we either have to be paragliding or snowboarding. So, Very man, cool. if you can do two in the same month, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good month. So, I guess in 
on that topic of being a digital nomad, I, you know, I think people have this idea in their mind of what that looks like, especially seeing influencers and different things online. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you're on these trips, how much are you actually working? What's your, you know, work-life balance, so to speak, when you're when you're traveling? Yeah. Um, well, the cool part about is, you know, traveling. Um, you know, being a digital nomad, right? There's multiple different ways of being a digital nomad. You know, you can obviously uh, you can be a freelancer, where you know, hey, you do Facebook ads um, for a company, or you're a, a copywriter, right? So you're basically paid by the project. So you can kind of squeeze that in wherever you want to. Um, now these days, there's a lot more people being quote unquote influencers and mm-hmm. being digital nomads, right? They typically either have some sort of affiliate product that they're referring or recommending, whether that's a fitness plan or supplements or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> and then there's other people who they create their own products, digital courses, such as what what I've done. Um, and so when it comes to me, when I travel, it truly is pretty leisurely uh, most of the time. Um, I was in, this, in uh, Thailand for the month of December. Wow. And that entire month, I think I spent four hours for the entire month doing anything related to the freight business. Um, That's amazing. <laughs> absolutely. You know, I think people's jaw, I, can, I heard someone's jaw drop and hit the, hit the table right now. <laughs> it's one of the listeners out there. Yeah, man, that's where it comes down to business systems, you know, and um, not, you know, from the get go, you can't typically set it up like that. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, as long as you're building the company based with that end in mind, then you'll eventually get there. Yeah. It might take you six months, it might take you six years. For me, it, it took the better part of six years. And yeah. so, um, you know, it pays off though, right? Exactly. Worth every minute. Yeah. Absolutely. That's fantastic. <laughs> so dive a little bit deeper into kind of the areas of where you can have your digital nomad expertise. Mm-hmm. What are some of those areas? I mean, you mentioned one as far as being influencer, like affiliate marketing. I know the vlogging is getting really big uh, via YouTube, but yeah. I mean, you yourself are doing coaching, drop shipping's one. I mean, am I overlooking any? Is there any oh my gosh. hot ones right now? That yeah, these days there's there's a ton. I mean, yeah, sure. um, online trading, whether that's cryptocurrency, stocks, forex. I know a lot of guys doing that. Um, um, consulting, just straight up consulting, like how to help somebody scale their business if you're really good at that kind of a thing. Um, I know a guy who is a professional uh, uh, pickup artist consultant. He teaches guys how to get girls. Wow. And gets a real life hitch, handsome. huh? Exactly. Yeah, real <laughs> life hitch. And just does it all online. And Wow. Yep. So, I mean, if there's something that you're good at or you might just have a knack for better than the next guy, you can easily turn it into a profitable profitable business with the right marketing and structure to it. That's amazing. Yep, 100% of the time. Very cool. So where do you draw the line as far as within all those facets of where people can create businesses? Where would you say your maybe top three to five areas of focus are where you really consider yourself the, the expert? Um, I would definitely say consulting um, when it comes to building a business, um, even you know investing as well. Um, I think I have you know pretty decent knack for that. Um, you know, some of that is favor and, you know, right place, right time. But ultimately, you know, they say that your network is your net worth. And so the larger the network, the more opportunities you're going to see. Now, I do have a, when I was in Chiang Mai, when I was in Thailand, uh, you know, I met up with uh, probably about 18 different digital nomads. Wow. I live there full time. And these guys are making $25,000 a month plus uh, doing drop shipping from China. And so, there it is, drop shipping again. I can't wait to, to dive deeper on that, but, <laughs> but keep going. <laughs> yeah, so drop shipping is another big one, you know, yeah. whether that's drop shipping from China or maybe your Amazon FBA fulfilled by Amazon and you're shipping everything out through Amazon. Uh, that's another great one. Um, if you are a, a talented writer, that's an easy way to get into copywriting um, or agency owner, just like what we've done with Synaptic Media. You know, there's clients all over the place, and you know, you're going to see a lot of people online complain that there's not enough business out there. There is. It's just you know, you being the one that's in front of them, and you're the one that's kind of leaving the impression. Right. That's an easy way for people to get started, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks for the, the overview of that. Mm-hmm. And so this, this drop shipping thing is is just on my mind. So. Yeah. I guess I think I know the answer to this just based on the conversation we've had already, but I mean, is drop shipping all it's cracked up to be? And I guess if it is, do you think it's, has it peaked or is it still a good time for anyone who's interested in it to, to jump on board? Yeah, uh, drop shipping has definitely peaked. Yeah. We live in a Amazon Prime world mm-hmm. and people don't want to wait two weeks, three weeks to get their products from China. 
no matter how cheap they are. Right. Uh, people are becoming way more savvy to buying things from these Chinese retailers online. And I'm not going to say the name of the major one because I'm going to help those other dropshippers out there yeah. and not give away their secrets. I'm sure uh, they appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Kudos to you, sir. And Get so, some clients coming back your way now. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to marketing, holler at me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so I, it definitely has hit its peak. I still know guys, you know, making 20,000 plus a month doing it. So, That's incredible. um, you know, there's still opportunity. That's the thing though, is no matter what industry, there's always opportunity. It doesn't matter if you're in the biggest recession of the century, there's always opportunity. Um, you know, fortune favors the bold. And so if you were that one, uh, going out there against all odds, putting the numbers up, um, you know, go, you know, attending the webinars, getting the most recent updated training, staying plugged in how Facebook ads is working in order to optimize your store to to sell those products and make a great profit because you know the minimum markup for a drop shipper is 400%. Wow. Um, and anything less than that is really hard to be profitable. Now anything 400% or above, you're extremely profitable as long as you've got your, your marketing set up right. Yeah. So um, it's definitely not dead. It is dying, mm -hmm. um, but it is also kind of being stabilized simply because a lot of these, you know, Chinese companies who are making the products, they're creating U.S.-based warehouses, very much like Amazon. So rather than drop shipping it from China and taking it two, three weeks, you're now getting it anywhere between two and five days, which is helping these drop shippers compete with right. everybody else. But it does tap into their profits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, thanks for the insight on that. That's, that's something that's always interested me, and I always get targeted with ads on you know YouTube and Facebook Absolutely. about drop shipping and drop shipping courses and, and all that. So mm -hmm. appreciate the the insight from someone who's who's been there and knows about it. Definitely. What advice would you have for someone who wants to be a digital nomad, or maybe not even be a digital nomad, but just you know start an online business and, and be an entrepreneur? What what advice would you give them? Um, first things first, don't rush anything. Um, but also don't hesitate. And let me kind of explain that. Um, don't rush into anything because what happened to me early on is I went where the money was and I kept chasing different ventures, different opportunities, one thing after another, just trying to find something to hit for me. It wasn't something I was passionate about. It wasn't because I was doing it for the greater good. It was strictly for the dollar bill. And, you know, I never crossed any lines, never did anything illegal um, that I'll talk about on there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know what I mean? It's just one of those things like you can always chase the dollar and right. it's always going to be ahead of you. Mm -hmm. But when you slow down to speed up, right, you figure out what you're truly passionate about first. Then you can actually build a business based around that passion. And that's really what I hope most people take from Digital Nomad University and our, our online community is that, you know, this is not a rush, right? You're seeing all these other people, even these 16 year olds making six figures a year plus, just crushing it online. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes you fall into this comparison game. You see someone out there doing better than you. They've maybe even been doing it less time than you, but ultimately they have, they've found their niche, they found what works for them, and they found something they're passionate about. And that's typically what the underlying, you know, factor is, is passion. So why not start with your passion in mind build a business around that passion, you know, whether that's fitness, whether it's fly fishing, whether it's nutrition, whether it's dancing, uh, it doesn't really matter. You can build a business around it. So start there, build from that. And if you're not sure how to make that profitable, um, either one, come join our community where we're going to be teaching you that thing, that sort of thing, or jump on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, there's all the, you know, how do I turn my passion into a paycheck? Search that on YouTube and you're going to find more than vi more videos than you can handle that yeah. are going to teach you that exact th same thing, or at least get you started down that path. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, on that note, as far as some of the programming you offer, I've seen, uh, you talk about the, the three step blueprint. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're, you're willing to disclose or talk about or kind of give a high level ov overview of, you know, what that is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, the cool part about this is it's, it's very simple. And so all I'm doing is I'm taking the same three-step blueprint that people are paying for every single month. I'm going to give it to you right now. Um, and I, I'm just going to simplify it, right? There obviously, there's some depth to it. But um, really what it comes down to is, one, fi figure out what you're passionate about and ultimately find your niche in that passion project, right? If that's fitness, maybe you are the high-intensity you know, uh, high trainer fitness guy, right? So what you, once you've found your niche, uh, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna start giving away free value, right? To essentially build an audience around the free value that you provide. People will call that freemium, freemium content. 
And once you have a large enough audience of people who are bought into you, bought into the free value that you're providing, at that point in time, you can either offer them up a, a product that you personally use, right? If you're in fitness, maybe that's a supplement and you partner up with a company, you become an affiliate for them. You make 25% of every sale that you push through their, their way. That would be affiliate sales. Now, maybe on the other side, you, uh, you love creating your own products. You wanna create a workout plan that you update every single month and you create a membership program. I love membership programs, that's, that's how ours works. Uh, that way people are plugged in, they stay plugged in because it's coming out of their account every month. And you can keep them up to date with the latest and greatest in fitness, supplements, etc. cetera. And um, so yeah, step one, just kind of reiterate, is find your niche. Step two is build an audience around that niche by providing free value. Too many people try to rush into the money, that's why I say slow down to speed up provide a ton of free value. And the law of reciprocity will say that as much value as you've given, you're gonna receive 10 times more. Yeah. And I can tell you that is 110% the truth. Give that free value away for step two. Step three, provide a, a valuable product that solves a problem or a pain point for that specific niche that you've created. So very simple, uh, a lot of people overcomplicate it, but no need to. Just you know, go at your own pace. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. And ultimately, just put the work in because it is going to take work. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, I'm sorry, your life is over now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No doubt, you gotta gotta make uh, sacrifices. Absolutely. So I guess to do a little bit of live coaching here, since <clears throat> I'm interested in podcasting. Absolutely. Uh, that's obviously a niche in itself, and I have the passion of storytelling, so that's kind of my step one, right? Yeah. Yep. And then step two would be doing things like this and producing the prod podcast and having people on such as like yourself who have expert knowledge in certain areas that entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who want to get started uh, can learn from. Absolutely. And then eventually maybe advertising dollars will come along or something like for, for step three. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've done it thus far, but um, you know, if I were you, the next step would definitely be a blog where I can host all the content. Um, and then obviously maybe move into some video podcasts one of these days as well so that you've got video content. You're driving more and more traffic from YouTube. Uh, YouTube is going to be the best traffic generator even for podcasts, uh, which is why you see all the major guys on YouTube as well. They tape all of those because uh, when it comes to free SEO, free traffic, YouTube is your friend. Um, Instagram, Facebook, all these platforms are pay to play. And YouTube is the only one that is truly, obviously, um, geared into the the Google platform. And so anyone who's going to be searching for something that one of your guests or you are offering on a podcast, they're going to find you much easier that way. And it's going to lead them to your website, to your podcast, and grow things that way. So that's going to be a huge piece. And then ultimately, that might you know come down to uh, you know how to create your own podcast course later on down the line that you could offer. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to you know, put words in your mouth or anything, but there's, uh, yeah, just so much opportunity ahead. And it, what it really comes down to is just building that audience. So I guess to, to wrap it up, uh, I usually ask, what are some good books? I know you mentioned Four Hour Work Week being one, but yeah. besides that, are there any others that you would recommend to listeners? Absolutely. Um, I, I have to say this one because it's where I've drawn the most knowledge from, um, Bible. And the Bible is the number one book when it comes to um, you know, not just uh, mental knowledge, but spiritual knowledge, because we do live in a third dimensional world, but we are spirits living in a human body and in, in a third dimension. So uh, if you understand how the other side works, then it's going to play in your favor big time. And so that's why I said favor earlier, because um, there's certain things that have happened in my life that I cannot take credit for. I can't take credit for really any of my success. I can only take take credit for the hard work I've put in. Yeah. Uh, but the opportunities that I've been blessed with, the people I've met along the way, uh, a lot of those have been complete divine intervention and uh, that really comes down to my faith. And yeah. so that would be numero uno. Uh, number two would probably be 4 Hour Work Week. <laughs> um, another great book is uh, The Magic of Thinking Big by David J. Schwartz. I think I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's an uh, incredible book. I read it years and years ago and um, man, it pulled me out of uh, some very toxic and negative mindset thinking um, really set me on a good pace when it came to you know the possibilities of what could be as long as you allow your mind to go there. Mm -hmm. And um, with that book, you know, it just talks about you know there's three three diseases in life. You know, 
Um, I'm probably going to fail to come up with all three right now, but you know, number one is excusitis. Mm. It keeps people from success. <laughs> um, and goodness, I got the other two on the tip of my tongue. We might go back to that later, but uh, actually read the book. You'll get the other there two. There you go. Good Maryland. plug. Yeah. Good plug. <laughs> um, yeah, so another great book. Um, you know, I know, I know a lot of people are big in, you know, um, think and grow rich and all that kind of stuff, you know, really harps on law of attraction and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm not really a law of attraction type of guy. Um, I definitely think there's laws that are set up in the universe that God put in place, etc. But ultimately when you take him out of the equation and you put you at the God of your own world, you're in a dangerous place because mm -hmm. I don't ever want to be responsible for that. You know yeah. what I mean? And so I can only, you know, thank him for the things that he's put in my life, but I can't take credit for it. And I think that's a big push of what, you know, Think and Grow Rich does and puts out there. And, um, you know, I think that Napoleon Hill was definitely a genius. Uh, but I also think that he might have been tapping into some things that, you know, you might want to and, and also you might not want to. Right. So um, that's, yeah, we'll save that for another podcast. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. All good recommendations. Appreciate that. Absolutely. So I want this podcast to be a resource for you, but also for listeners. So where can people best get a hold of you if they're curious about becoming a digital nomad, enrolling in some of your courses, taking Digital Nomad University, et cetera? Um, really best way to find me is, is social. Um, you know, uh, my website is www.digitalnomadu, just the letter U, dot com for Digital Nomad University. Um, my current Instagram handle, which I think I'm actually going to change because <laughs> I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, no man is self-made. Currently, my Instagram is self-made DT for Drew Taylor. Um, but I'm probably just going to go to Drew T. Taylor here pretty soon. Um, but, it, you know, depending on when you hear this, search self made DT, you'll probably find me. Um, and then also, if you search on Facebook for Digital Nomad University, you're going to find obviously my Facebook page, but then also the Facebook group. And this is, uh, you're not going to find the private group for the paid members, but you will find the free group for, for the newbies who are really just trying to, you know, wrap their mind around how this whole thing works. And, um, you know, I'm throwing, throwing free value out in there all the time, teaching people exactly what they need to do. It's a great place to ask questions, get those answered. And it's just really, you know, a good community, a family of people helping people. Um, there's not really any, any sharks in there trying to sell anybody anything, which is awesome. It's just straight value. And so if you're really looking to kind of head down that path, it's a great place to start. Awesome. Drew, thanks so much for your time and really appreciate being here. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. Really appreciate it. That wraps up today's episode. I want to thank you all again for listening. My name is Eric Huey. And my goal is to provide you with inspiring content that helps you do your job better or go after your big goals. I'd appreciate your feedback with a rating or review on whichever platform you found the show. And if you'd like to share your feedback directly, or if you know someone who would be a great guest on the show, feel free to email me directly at genyleaders at gmail.com. That's G-E-N-W-H-Y-L-E-A-D-E-R-S at gmail.com. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.